Genesis chapter 30, verse 25, all the way to the end of chapter 31. Okay. So we're going to cover some ground tonight. Uh, we're reading about Jacob. And if you remember the story, I'll just give a recap. And for those of you that might not know the, the whole story, uh, Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau because he had stole his birthright. Uh, and it didn't steal his birthright, he stole the blessing. Excuse me. He, he uh, deceived his father Isaac and stole the blessing. And uh, he had to flee because his brother Esau said he was going to kill him. So his mother, Rebekah, told him to go to her uncle or her brother, whose name was Laban. And uh, when Jacob went to Laban's house, he saw Laban's daughter, Rachel, and he fell in love with Rachel. It was, uh, you know, love at first sight. As soon as he saw her, it was there. Uh, and he worked for seven years with Laban to, uh, to have Rachel. We know what Laban did, don't we? Instead of on, on the wedding night, after they had all been well drunk and had a good time and, and Jacob got ready to consummate his marriage, Laban pulled the switch o on him and put Leah in her place. Leah wasn't quite as attractive as Rachel was. But uh, Laban said, well, we have to marry the oldest daughter first instead of the youngest daughter. And uh, so Jacob got stuck with Leah. But then he got Rachel and had to work another seven years, okay? So anyway, you can read about that and read it, understand it more than that simple little synopsis I gave you. But in verse 25, we know that in, uh, in that time, in that seven years, Jacob had 11 sons to his two wives and their handmaids. We know that Rachel was barren until almost the very end of that time, and she had a son named Joseph, who was one of the youngest sons of Israel. But the other, uh, Leah had eight sons, or uh, six sons to herself, and there were two to her handmaiden. Uh, Rachel had two sons to a handmaiden, you know, surrogate mother, and she finally had one. So there were 11 sons. In seven years, Jacob had 11 sons, uh, and he worked for Laban, tending his flocks and so forth. And it came to verse, uh, when we come to verse 25, and this is where we kind of jump in the story. And it came to pass, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, send me away, that I might go into my country, my own place, into my country. Verse 26, give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service, which I have done thee. Uh, Jacob said, you know, it's been 20 or 14 years now. I fulfilled my obligation to you. I have my wife. I have my children. It's time for me to go back to my country. And Laban said, in verse 27, he said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for thy sake. Now, remember last week we talked about some under undercurrents uh, in this story. Remember when he said how when Jacob had deceived his father, that this was a time of probation for him. That God was using this time. He, he met up with his uncle Laban, who was a bigger con man than he was. And Laban pulled some fast ones on. And it was like God was showing Jacob himself in Laban. Uh, and there was a purpose for that, because remember we said that this whole thing was a journey from being Jacob, which meant con man, to Israel, which means a prince of God. It's a transitional time for Jacob. So Jacob's ready to go back home, but God wasn't quite ready for him to go back there yet. So Laban says, listen, I've been blessed because of you, because God promised Jacob when he was... On his way there, remember he stopped at a place called Bethel, God promised Jacob that he would bless him, that his seed would bless the earth, that he would give him the land, and all the same promises he made to Abraham, he made to Jacob. So Jacob, even though he wasn't this, uh, like a stellar example of what a follower of God should be, God blessed him. Every place he went, God was ready to bless him. So Laban recognized that, that, you know, Laban, he had so much. When Jacob came on the scene, he started to see his flocks get blessed, his his, his uh, family was being blessed. So he said, hey. He said, uh, I found out by experience 
that uh, the Lord has blessed me for your sake. And he said, appoint me thy wages and I will give it. Now he asked that question one other time. You remember when we, when we talked about, and we do have these things on CDs if you want to listen to the last couple of weeks. John will make you copies. But uh, the first time, you know, Laban asked Jacob, what do you want me to pay you? Jacob said, I want Rachel. Well, we know what happened with that. <laughs> okay. He, he did get racial for another seven years of work, but he got, he got Leah too, okay? And Leah wasn't as good looking. He said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it, Laban said. And he said unto him, uh, now Jacob is speaking to Laban, You know how I've served you, and how your cattle was with me. For it was little which thou had when I came, and it is now increased into a multitude, and the Lord has blessed you since my coming. And now... When shall I provide for mine own house also? Jacob was saying, you know, I've, your flocks have been blessed, your stuff has been blessed, but I really don't have anything. I have two wives, and I have 11 kids, and I don't really have anything that's my own. So he says, uh, Laban said to him in verse 31, What shall I give you? And Jacob said, You shall not give me anything. I don't want you to give me anything. You know, Jacob, men of God sometimes, godly men, they don't want to take anything from, from the heathen. They don't want to take anything from people that aren't godly. Just like Abraham, when he had the victory over, over the generals, and uh, the, the king of Sodom wanted to give him the stuff, he said, I don't want it. I don't want to take your stuff. Jacob said, I don't want you to give me anything. I don't want to owe you anything, is really the implication here. He says, I don't want you to give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again feed and keep your flock. Verse 32. I will pass through all your flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and speckled among the goats and of such shall be my hire. Now, in a flock of a herd of sheep, most sheep are white, but you're going to get some that have spots on them and some that have stripes on them. And, and Jacob was saying, listen, just you know, give me the striped ones and the spotted ones and they'll be mine. I'll, I'll keep them separate, they'll be mine, I'll watch your flocks, but I'll just keep all the spotted and speckled ones. And uh, he says in verse uh, 33, So shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come, when it shall come from my hire before thy face, every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. And Laban said, Behold, I would it might be according to your word. So here's the deal. Jacob said, give me the spotted, give me the streak, give me the ones, you know, that are, that are sort of, they were considered like less, you know, desirable than the pure white ones. So I'll keep them, and that, that'll, be my, that'll be my pay. And when I'm, when I'm all done serving you for like another seven years, I'll, I'll take all the spotted ones, and you get all the, all the white ones. Okay. So Laban said, that sounds like a good deal to me. So what did Laban do? Listen to what he did. Verse 35. And he removed that day the he-goats that were ring-straked and spotted, and all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, and every one that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them unto the hands of his sons. L Laban, after making this deal with Jacob, went and took all the spotted and, 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 and all the striped, and took them out so Jacob wouldn't have any. So all the sheep he would have would be white ones. And Laban is saying, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let him go, you know, see what happened. Laban was a character, wasn't he? He was really something. <clears throat> and it says in verse 36, And he said, Three days' journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flock. So here's the story. Again, we want to put this in perspective. Jacob and Laban made a deal. Jacob said, All the spotted, all the striped are, are going to be mine. Laban said, Sounds like a good idea to me. And he took all the spot and striped out of his flock and gave them to his sons and sent them three days away. So now Jacob got a flock of white sheep. And he's got to figure out some way to get some spotted and speckled out of them white sheep. Okay. Now, this next portion of scripture, it's one of those portions that a lot of people wish wasn't there. Okay. But when you, when you read it, and when you begin to study some of the things, it, it, just at first glance, it, it sounds kind of sounds kind of crazy. But I'm going to explain the way this the way this went with Jacob, okay? Because skeptics and atheists love this next passage of scripture because they say, you see, the Bible's just full of folklore and superstition. You can't believe it. Now listen, to what happened? 
Verse 37. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle ring strakes speckled and spotted. Now, Jacob wasn't a genetic engineer, okay, and and I'm not either. I'm not a biologist. I'm not a. I, I don't you know I don't know about genetics and genes and horm, you know uh, chromosomes and stuff like that. But I know this much: if a woman looks at a picture of a bodybuilder when she's pregnant, that doesn't mean the kid's going to come out being a bodybuilder, <laughs> okay. And a lot of people read this story and they say, you see. See, the Bible is just about, now, supposing, supposing, and we're going to see as we read into the next chapter, that it was God that gave Jacob the increase here, ultimately. But, but uh, supposing that Jacob really thought that that, that worked, that if, if, the, if the sheep looked at, at you know, white and striped broads, they would have offspring like that. Well, the Bible's just recording Jacob following an old wives' tale. It doesn't mean the Bible says that's the way it worked. Okay. But I want you to consider this. <clears throat> Jacob was not a biologist. He, was, he didn't understand. They didn't know anything about genetics. They didn't know about chromosomes. They didn't know about genes back then. But one thing Jacob knew about, he knew sheep. He'd been, he'd been watching over sheep for 14 years. He knew that flock. And here's something they have learned. In the 1800s, there was a, a, a biologist named Gregor Mendel that, that did a lot of work with uh, traits and you know the way traits are passed on from one generation to the next and so forth and his work is still considered you know the, the way it is <clears throat> Jacob knew that even though they were all white sheep in that flock at one time they were white and speckled so there might have been white sheep but those white sheep could have contained genes containing traits of spotted and speckled so Jacob knew enough because he knew sheep. He knew that eventually there was going to be some spotted and speckled sheep come out here somewhere. Okay, because that's just a matter of the way it works. And he knew that because he, he knew sheep for 14 years. So somebody says, okay, well, what about the white sticks? Okay. Notice that it identifies three particular trees, green poplar and the hazel and the chestnut tree. Now, I could have said, well, you know, he took some branches and, and cut them and put them in a watering trough. And, okay. But I identified these three trees. Now, you might think this is far-fetched, but I don't think it's far-fetched. Because I believe the Bible is true. I believe what God says is true. So, obviously, the fact that these sheep were looking at rods that were striped didn't make them have striped offspring. I believe, and, and I, I think we all know this. Has anybody here ever take, like, herbal stuff? You know, do you know where aspirin comes from? White willow bark. It came from white willow bark. If you, if you trace most of the medications that people take, some of the antibiotics, they came from, originally, from natural, from natural plants. Barks, trees, plants, herbs, okay? It could very well be, and we don't know this, this was 3,500 years ago, but we don't know this, but it could very well be that those particular trees had some kind of medicinal purpose, perhaps antibiotic, perhaps uh, they could stimulate ovulation in the in the uh, in the in the sheep. You know, there are, there are drugs that people take. You know, fertility drugs and so forth. We don't know that, but I believe that that Jacob knew that these particular branches would work with. You know, if you put them in the water trust where the where the animals would drink it, he was treating the water to give himself a, a stronger, healthier, perhaps more uh, fertile flock. And it goes on, it says, it says in verse uh, 38 again, And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks and the gutters and the watering troughs, when the flocks came to drink, that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring strakes, speckled and spotted. That word conceived in the Hebrew is actually translated ha. Translated hot. 
So it could very well be that there was some kind of medicinal quality that would cause, that would encourage uh, ewes to be in heat. You know, when they go in heat, that's when they make babies. <laughs> that's when they make little lambs. So I really believe that this is a, this is a, you know, this is a, 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 an ancient story about a shepherd using techniques that they knew back then to try to increase the, uh, the fertility of, of their flocks. So I don't believe it's just, it was some kind of magic that they just looked at striped rods and had striped sheep, okay? But people will think what they want to see. Okay. And he goes on and he says this. Verse 40. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straight and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them out, uh, put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters, that they might conceive among the rods. What he was doing, he was practicing animal husbandry, good breeding practices in a flock. That they would learn, you know, again, that's all he did. You know, these, somebody was a shepherd back then. It wasn't like they went out there with a PlayStation 3 while the sheep were eating grass. That's all they did was watch sheep. That was their job. I mean, day and night, they went out with the sheep. And so he knew all about sheep. So when, 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 when he would see that, that uh, a striped lamb would be born, he would separate it. And when another striped one over here would be, he'd be, he separate that, and he would put them together. And he learned how to, it was selective breeding. And if one was kind of, some one was kind of sickly, he would sort of put it off to the side. He would do, he was, he was just garnering for himself what was his, his flocks, what he, what he bargained for, okay? It says, in verse 43, And the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle, and maidservants, and men servants, and camels, and asses. God blessed Jacob. He blessed Jacob. Jacob had been ripped off by his uncle. He'd been, he'd been lied to him. We're going to read here, when we go into the next chapter, he kind of gives a catalog of everything that happened to him. But God blessed Jacob. Why? Because God told him he would. Remember, all this is happening. It looks like what has happened to Jacob with Uncle Laban looks bad. Especially what Laban did to him. But we know, we said this last week, it was God preparing his plan. God preparing the nation through whom the Messiah would come. The, the 11 sons of Jacob and eventually the 12th one who would be Benjamin, who would be born after his return to the promised land, would be the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, who was a con man, who was a trickster, he was, he was somebody you wanted to avoid. He went from being that to being a prince of God. And it had to go all through this process that we've been reading about. Almost 20 years of being lied to and cheated. 20 years of, last week we talked about how his wives were, the two sisters were always fighting, you know, fighting with each other. There, there was contention going on. There was a battle. Who's going to have, who's going to have more kids? We talked about how Leah was always the ugly one and the one who was despised and Rachel was the beautiful one, yet Leah was the one who was blessed with children Rachel was barren. And how that brought ten. Can you just imagine what Jacob had to put up with? We know that when Joseph was born, and we, uh, we read this later on in Genesis, he was hated by all his brothers, but he was Jacob's favorite because he came out of Rachel. Okay. So Jacob's going through all this in a foreign land that's not his, with an, with an uncle that's ripping them off. And it's all for God's purpose. It's all for God's purpose. I said, God, how, why are you doing this to me? Well, maybe if, if Jacob would have waited and not ripped off his dad, maybe he wouldn't have had to go through all that. But God has a way of taking wherever we are and making it, turning it to what he wants, wants to happen. Okay? Now, chapter 31. Here we go. Jacob's doing well. He got all kinds of striped, spotted sheep. They're strong and healthy. He got wives. He got kids. He got stuff. Verse 31. And he heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's. 
Well, no, he didn't. In fact, Laban tried to take away everything he said he could have. God blessed Jacob. God blessed Jacob. But, it said he's trying to take away all that was our father's. And of that which was our father's, has he gotten all the glory. He said, well, Jacob, he's just, he's, just, he's just mooching off our dad. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. Things were getting a little touchy in the Laban household. Things weren't quite so peaceful and nice. Laban wasn't looking as uh, friendly toward Jacob as he used to. Things were getting a little tense. Okay. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred. And listen, I will be with you. I will be with you. You remember? And we're, and we're going to go back to when Jacob first left his home and he went to a place called Bethel. Just going back uh, to chapter 20, 28 and look at verse just, just a review. Verse 10. Now this is when this is when Jacob, this is before he even saw Laban. This was at the this was 20 years before what we were reading here in the other chapter. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place, and put them for his pillows, and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land where you lie, to you will I give it, and to your seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed the Abrahamic covenant. And behold, I am with you and will keep you in all places where, wherever you go and will bring you again into this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So we see Jacob goes back to that promise. I'll never leave you. I'm giving you this land. I'm going to give you children. I'm going to give you all these things. Now he didn't tell him in that dream, he didn't tell him, I'm going to send you to an uncle that's going to rip you off for 20 years. He didn't tell him that. Okay, so going back, and we, we'll probably go back there again before it's over. Going back to chapter 31, in verse 3, The Lord said unto Joseph, Now he's saying, Return unto the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the, to the field unto his flock. He didn't want to talk to them back home with Laban. And said unto them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not toward me as before. Laban knew what was going on. He finally, he finally figured out what was happening with his flocks. See, Jacob did a good job, and God blessed him. He says, his, his countenance is not to me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my power I have served your father. And your father has deceived me. And changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckle shall be your wages, then all the cattle bear speckle. And if he said thus, the ring strake shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring strake. Thus God has taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Jacob recognized that whatever, when we talked before about the stripe, whatever went on there, it was God that gave the increase. It was God that made it happen because God blessed Jacob. This is almost like God is repaying Jacob for the 20 years he got ripped off. You see, God knew what was going on. God saw Laban's heart. He knew what Laban was going to do to Jacob. He said, verse 10, And it came to pass, at the time that the cattle conceived, that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. 
And the angel of God spoke unto me in the dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now your eyes and see. All the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring straight, speckled, and grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban has done unto thee. So God is clearly telling Jacob, I'm going to repay. Listen, this is, this, is, this is not in the Bible, but it's true. What goes around comes around. God makes everything right. God makes everything right. It might take 20 years, but God makes everything right for his people. Somewhere down the line. Okay. God sees. When you get ripped off, God sees. When somebody takes advantage of you, God sees. When somebody uh, treads you underfoot, God sees. God sees everything you're going through. He saw what Jacob was going through. Jacob was probably saying, why didn't you do something about it before? Well, God had a reason. We're going to see it as Jacob goes back to the land, as it becomes Israel. We're going to see the reason. Okay. He said in verse 13, I am the God of Bethel. What we just read back in, what was it, chapter 28? He said, I'm the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar, and where you vowed a vow unto me, now arise, get thee out from this land, and return unto the land of thy kindred. So God reminded Jacob, when he was coming from, when he initially went to the place where Laban was, when he had that dream, he set up a, a, a pillar as a monument, where he called it Bethel, which means the house of God. He marked that place. God reminded him, he says, I'm the same God that you met there. Now it's time for you to go back. Okay, now look at verse 14. And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? He ripped his own daughters off. Are we not counted of him as strangers? For he has sold us and has quite devoured also our money. Well, they weren't very happy either. They were probably saying it's about time. Okay. For all the riches which God has taken from our Father that is ours and our children's now then, whatsoever God has said unto you, do. So Rachel and Leah said, we're in. Let's go. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's pack. Let's move. Then Jacob rose up and set his sons and wives upon camels. And he carried away all his cattle and all his goods which he had gotten, the cattle of his getting which he had gotten in Padanaram, for to go to Isaac, his father, in the land of Canaan. This is what we like to call in Arnold, we call this a midnight move. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you ever see one of them? <laughs> we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be laying in bed and we'll hear that big old moving truck out there about 11.30 at night. <laughs> okay. Some of you know what I'm talking about. That's all right. Uh, okay. And Laban went to shear his sheep, and Rachel had stolen the images that were her father's. Now again, we need to, we need to understand what's, what's being said here. The images. The word is teraphim. What these were, there's, we're really not exactly sure, but they were probably like household, like good luck charms. Okay? Uh, and and they, were, they were little little statues of gods that they would, they would use, this, maybe used to, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, the dashboard Jesus? Okay? <laughs> and, you know, the, you know the, I grew up in a church where you had like little medals and little statues that you put places in. You know, if you, if you lost something, you would get your St. Anthony statue out and pray to God and would try to find. You know, they, they, they were little, little idols that they would have, and they would be like, they're, they're gods, okay? Uh, for some reason, Rachel decided to steal her father's good luck charms. Now, whether she thought she needed them, or whether she thought that, hey, well, he owes them to us. We don't, I don't know what her, we don't know what her thinking was behind doing this. But it was very obvious that when she stole the images of her father, her father was not very pleased. And it seems, the implication here to me is that when he went out, when they would go out to shear the sheep, they would probably take some of these good luck charms because that was like a yearly thing. And when he couldn't find the good luck charms, it was like, you know, it was like Barney Fife with his rabbit's foot. I don't know if you remember that episode or not. Okay. 
Laban went out to shear the sheep in verse 19, and Rachel had stolen the images of the teraphim that were her father's. Now, Jacob didn't know anything about that. Nobody knew anything about that except Rachel. And Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian, in that he told him not that he fled. So he fled with all that he had, and he rose up and passed over the river and set his face toward Mount Gilead. And it was told Laban on the third day that Jacob was fled, and he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days' journey. And they overtook him in Mount Gilead. Laban was not happy. He overtook Jacob. It, it, it was like he, he went like 300 miles in seven days. They pressed. I mean, they were like a forced march. Okay, they wanted, he, wanted, he wanted Jacob. Now listen to this. Verse 24. And God came to Laban the Syrian. God spoke to Laban, who seemed to be a heathen. He spoke to Laban in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Now I'm reading this, and again, I'm thinking, God, why didn't you speak to Laban 20 years ago? Why didn't you say to Laban, don't rip him off? But now he speaks to Laban. Don't say good or don't say bad. Okay, verse 25. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mountain, and, in the mount, and Laban with his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, here's the confrontation. Here's the confrontation. Twenty years is coming to this, what we're going to read right here. Twenty years of God using Laban to help get Jacob from being a con man to a prince of Israel, a prince of God. Okay? He says, Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you have stolen away unawares from me and carried my daughters as captives taken with the sword? Well, that was a lie. They couldn't wait to get out. They said, get me out of here. We didn't have nothing here. He's saying, you can't accuse him of kidnapping his daughters. Wherefore did you steal away uh, secretly, in verse 27, uh, did, did you flee secretly and steal away from me and did not tell me that I might have sent thee away with mirth and with songs and with tabard and with harp? Yeah, right, Laban. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, you want to have a big party, right? We'll just have a big going away party. And you've not suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters. You have done foolishly in so doing. Now listen to what Laban says. It is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. And that's what Laban had originally meant to do. I think he wanted to kill Jacob. Take all his stuff back. The stuff he thought was his. But the God of your father spoke unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. And now, though thou wouldst needs be gone, because thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore have you stolen my God? So here's Laban, he's saying, listen, you took my daughters, you left without letting me say goodbye to them, and on top of all that, you took my gods. You took my teraphim. And Jacob's like, what are you talking about? I don't take them. This is what he said. Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid, for I said, peradventure you would take by force thy daughters from me. He had a real good reason for thinking that, because that's the way Laban was. Jacob was afraid if I tell him I'm leaving, he might just grab everything back and send me home with nothing. Laban was capable of doing that. With whomsoever, he says in verse 32, with whomsoever thou findest thy gods, because Jacob, he had no clue that, that those things were anywhere in the camp. He didn't take them. He didn't think anybody else took them. He says, let him not live before our brethren, Discern thou what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen it. And Laban went into Jacob's tent, and into Leah's tent, and into the two maidservants' uh, maid tents, but he found them not. Then went he out of Leah's tent, and entered into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the images, and put them in a camel's furniture, and sat upon them. And Laban searched all the tent, but found them not. And she said to her father, Let it not displease my lord that I cannot rise up before thee, because I got the cramps. Okay. Now, and he searched not, but found not the images. In this, again, an underlying picture here. The God of Abraham, 
and Isaac and Jacob and the gods of the Syrians. What they held as being dear, what, what, what Laban was so upset about that, he, that his gods were taken from him. Didn't, didn't he understand his gods were nothing? His gods couldn't speak to him. They were just little statues. All the little statues we used to have around the house and the car, they couldn't speak to us. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob spoke to him in a dream. Okay? There's a little undercurrent there. God's showing how much greater he is than all the gods of the world. Just a little sidelight. Now, after all this, it's Jacob's turn. It's Jacob's turn. And Jacob was wroth. Twenty years of putting up with Laban. And now he's being accused of something he didn't do. At least he didn't think anybody did. Jacob answered and said to Laban in verse 36, What is my trespass? What is my sin that thou hast so hotly pursued after me? You've searched my stuff. What have you found of all your household stuff? Go ahead, let's see it. Set it here before me, before my brother and your brother, that they may judge betwixt us both. Where, where's all the stuff you said we stole? We couldn't find it. Verse 38. This 20 years, now, now, now Jacob, 20 years is coming out, okay? This 20 years have I been with you. Your ewes and your she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of your flock have I not eaten. I haven't taken anything, I haven't stolen anything off of you. That which was torn of beast, I, I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. When I, when I had the flocks out, if a, if, a, if, a, if a bear would come and take a sheep, I didn't, I didn't count that to you. I, I, I paid for it myself. Of my hand did you require, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was in the day, the drought consumed me, and frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. I, I've been spending 20 years with these sheep, day and night. I've been 20 years in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your cattle, and you changed my wages 10 times. I mean, Jacob's laying it out. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely you would have sent me away empty. See, through all this, God protected Jacob. Through, he was being ripped off. He was having his wages changed. He was being st stepped on. He was being treated like a doormat. Yet God still protected him. God was still with him through all that. You know, sometimes you feel like the world's stepping all over you. And you might look like, God, are you with me? You know, he's still with you. God has a purpose. He had a purpose for Jacob going through all this stuff. He could have sent his hand down and intervened and stopped the whole thing right then and there. But he let it go. Last week we said that Jacob had to come to grips with himself. And now he's on his way to the land of blessing. He's on his way back home. It says, Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, uh, uh, and the fear of Isaac, had been with me, surely thou hast sent me away, now empty. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked thee yesternight. When God spoke to you he, uh, the other night, he was, uh, the night before, he was, he was rebuking you for my sake. Verse 43. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, meaning these grandchildren, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that you see is mine, and what can I do this day unto these my daughters? Or under their children which they have born. Laban was saying, listen, do you think I hurt my own family? He might not have hurt his own family, but he sure wanted to do something to Jacob. Now therefore, come now, let us make a covenant. I am now, and let it be for witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. Where did we read that before? You know, when Jacob was on his way from, from, from the promised land to Laban, what we read before when he had that dream, Bethel, the house of God, and he set up a pillar of remembrance. That was the place, that's, that was the place where Jacob learned about God. Right there. Who he was. And God made all his promises to him. 
Now on his way back, he's going to set up another pillar. Because when Jacob learned about God in the first pillar, this, this other pillar is marking the place where Jacob learned about man. He learned about Laban. Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap. And they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called it, I'm not going to try to pronounce that. And Jacob called it Galid. Both those names mean a, a heap of testimony. One is Aramaic and one is Hebrew. And Laban said, This heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Galid. And Mizpah, for he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another. Now a lot of people think, when you hear that word Mizpah, and you'll see like the little hearts that go together, Mizpah, you know, between, the Lord watch between you and me. And we have turned it into like a sentimental like love thing. But this wasn't a love thing. This was, you stay on your side, and I'll stay on my side. He said, the Lord watch between me and you when we are absent from one another. Verse 50. If you will afflict my daughters, or if you will take otherwise beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over the heap to thee, and that you shall not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham, and the God of Nahor, and the God of their father, judge betwixt us, and Jacob swear by the fear of the father Isaac. So they said, Listen, you stay on your side, I'll stay on my side. And this marks the place where Jacob was finally separated from that Laban experience. Back to the promised land. He spent 20 years on probation with Laban. And now it's time for him to move on. As we read on in the next couple chapters, we're going to read about Jacob coming back to the promised land. We'll just, we'll just finish this chapter and read the last couple of verses. Jacob offered sacrifice upon the mount, called his brethren to eat bread, and they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. And early in the morning Laban rose up, kissed his sons and his daughters, and blessed them, and Laban departed. See you later, Laban. You know, I wonder if, if we as individuals, is God's taking us from what we used to be to being a prince or princess of God. Okay? We go through those times of trial and testing and those times where God forges us and makes us into the people he wants us to be. When we read next week when, when, when Jacob comes to a place called Peniel, which means I've come face to face with God. When Jacob gets to that place where he finally, you know, he heard about God on the way there he, he saw God in a dream, but on his way back, he's going to wrestle with God one-on-one. -on -one. Because God is taking him from being a con man to a prince, to a prince of God. I know a lot of times we go through situations and times in our lives. How many of you, how many of you have been through times when you feel like nothing is going your way? Trying to do right? But right doesn't happen. You get used. You get conned. You get stepped on. Now listen. Maybe. This may be. Now nah, just maybe. Maybe God wants, to take you, wants you to take a good look at yourself. Maybe God wants. You know, I believe God wanted Jacob to take a good look at himself. Because when you go through something like that. It will make you take a look at yourself. Matter of fact, that's all, that would be the first place you look. Because when you take a good look at yourself, that's when God can show you and change you. See, God changed Jacob. That whole 20 years, I believe God changed him on the inside. He learned. He learned what it meant to have faith in God. 
Because he remembered the promise that God made him at the very beginning. And he quoted it on his way back. These stories, these are ancient stories, and they're just stories in the book of Genesis. People will shrug them off and just say, oh, that's just a story. But every one of us in here was a Jacob. Every one of us in here has had that Laban experience. Maybe you're having it right now. Know this much, that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He said, I'll always be with you. So whatever you're going through, I think of that scripture that everybody knows from Romans. It says, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And they all work together, why? To conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. All working together to make us look like Jesus. It's all working together to change us from a con man to a prince of God. Amen? Amen. Do they have any comments or Questions or anything at all? Any comments? Before? Yes, Kathy. Maybe she felt better after they got sheared. I don't know. They might have felt, <laughs> I don't know. But, but uh, Anybody else have any comments? Or, a friend of mine, his, his sister had a sheep for him one time. And remember, we went up Shin, had, uh, Dave's sister, and they had sheep. One time they used to have pigs. Sheep, sheep's better than pigs. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Okay. Any other comments or anything else before we close? Good to have you all with us tonight. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. God protects us. We got him. God's on our side. <laughs> yes, Albert. stand we close with a word of prayer. Thank you all for being here again tonight. Father, we love you and we thank you for this time that we could spend. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus said he would never leave us or forsake us. That no matter what we're going through, if we belong to him, we know, Lord, that he will accomplish, you will accomplish your purpose in our lives. You will, you will conform us to the image of your son. You will take us from being a con man to being a prince of God. And you'll do whatever it takes You'll have Labans in our lives. You'll have people and things in our lives, Father, that will we'll try to, we think are trying to distract us and trip us up. But, Father, you'll use every one of those things if we allow you. You'll use every one of those things to turn us into the people you want us to be. Father, we love you and we give you glory. We ask you, Father, that you go with us tonight as we go from this place, not your presence. Help us be faithful to tell somebody about Jesus this week. Bring us back at the appointed time, Father. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name.
And everybody said, God bless you.